one of my electric fields. Would you all pretend like you're 16 years old and you're in a choir right now? Mm -hmm. And I would like you to all sing with an egg in the back of your throat. Ready to do that now? Put it in the back of your throat. Now just sing a five note scale. Ha, 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 go. Ha, 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 ha. Don't use any of your vocal training. <laughs> don't raise your soft palate, don't relax the pharynx muscles. Do that again. Pretend you're 16. Go. Ha, 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 ha. My presentation <laughs> is saying what you need in the choral rehearsal, a survey of false directives, and their implications on the efficiency of the singing process, choosing to paint teaching directives for singing to physiological truth. It is my opinion that a lot of misinformation about vocal production exists in the choral <coughs> profession. This is both fascinating and concerning. Over the course of this presentation, it is my intent to explore the data that I have collected in two choral forums on Facebook, the analysis of that data, and the ideas that stem from this data. The intent of this study is not to pass judgment, but to identify ways in which choral professionals can strive to be more factual and clear communicators in the rehearsal. It will require self-examination of what and how we give directives to our students. I wish to convey that when directives are given with clear and factual language, learning happens quicker and is more sustainable. Being more efficient with language in rehearsal will allow the conductor to focus on artistry instead of music <coughs> basics like notes and rhythms. In the last weeks leading to the performance, the choral catch-22 many school teachers face. My aim is to help clarify false directives in the choral rehearsal and provide solutions so that we can all progress together. I love stories, whimsy, imagery, and metaphor as much as the next teacher, but I hope that this presentation will help highlight a widespread problem of inadvertent false directives and encourage voice professionals to take more care in the language they use in the rehearsal. Many directives in the rehearsal are well-meaning and may even lead toward mostly correct but even well-respected veteran teachers can inadvertently use confusing language when attempting to create a metaphor or paint a picture for their students. Therefore, it is my intent to work on crafting language that is both exciting, evocative, and above all, painting to physiological truth in the latest voice science. Language is powerful. People often take its impact for granted and do not realize that what is said in the name of teaching could have unforeseen ramifications on the singing voice. Despite our best efforts as human communicators, we cannot account for what people hear and see, even when what we say in the classroom is correct and pinned to physiological truth. Because people's memories are fallible, clarity is incredibly important in everything, but specifically in teaching. People are always mixing in new information they hear with existing memories, affecting the way they understand directions. I hope to present many reasons why the lack of clarity in directives could be harmful and why it is important for voice professionals to carefully craft their directives and pin them to physiological truth and the latest voice science. Professor Lynn Helding outlines the pieces of my paper eloquently in her book, The Musician's Mind. <laughs> now we have one <laughs> Very gifted teachers are usually those who have vivid and eloquent descriptions. Many of us remember our teachers by their unique sayings, especially they were particularly imaginative and helpful. Verbal instructions can also be negative by being physiologically incorrect and thus sparking maladjustments. Breathe from the diaphragm is an ill-informed directive because it is not physiologically possible to do so. <laughs> At worst, it may summon in singers tasked with this impossible feat the vocal faults of extreme belly distension, collapsed ribcage, inattention to the pharynx, all of which contribute to poor breath management. Drop the jaw. An interesting one. Let's do this. Can you all pretend you're 16 again? Okay, or 17. And uh, everyone, I want you to drop your jaw when I say go, and then I want you to freeze, and then we're going to look around the room. Ready? Go. Now look around the room and see how different everybody looks. All of you are dropping your jaw in very different ways. You might be able to see how this could be a problem in the rehearsal. So, it may force the larynx down, may disengage a healthy pre-formatory set, not a healthy trachea cuff. It could also unhinge the mandible and create inflammation in the temporal mandibular joint. It could recruit the hyoglossus muscle backward into the vocal tract, restricting pharyngeal space needed for resonance. 
also contributing to the hyperfunction of a depressed larynx, making it almost impossible to utilize formal tuning. And it may lower the soft palate, which could cause a timbre that is undesirable unless putting on a character voice. From this one example, we can see the myriad ways in which one directive can be misinterpreted. During my ongoing study of vocology, I began to understand why specific language in the rehearsal matters so much. As I delved into myriad voice science subjects, I realized that if what is said in the name of whimsical imagery is not based on science or facts, such directives could cause unforeseen negative ramifications to our students. I remember becoming frustrated by all the sayings and stories I heard coming up as a chorister that eventually made my journey of learning to sing more difficult. See some nodding head back there. Mm -hmm. What might cause a conductor to issue a false directive? One answer may be that when a teacher is faced with a musical issue involving any of the following four systems of the voice, in respiration, phonation, resonance, and articulation, and is standing in front of a group of 60 choristers, Naturally, the teacher will do whatever it takes to come up with the quickest solution to the problem. Through my brief foray into voice science, I have recognized that oftentimes these quick solutions, while convenient, may make future rehearsals and the future music education of the student more difficult. Vague or misleading statements may cause the student to sing in a way that is inefficient or unhealthy. When these setbacks are not addressed, the student may be forced to unlearn much of what they were taught. If a teacher takes an extra 60 seconds to teach a concept correctly, that is not a waste of time, but a more efficient and structured way to teach for retention and repeatability. <laughs> the two hallmarks that something has been learned. If the concept is taught correctly the first time, it may not need to be revisited in every rehearsal. Thus, time will be saved in future rehearsals. When time is saved early on in the rehearsal process, musical artistry and nuance do not get left until the dress rehearsal. <laughs> there are many benefits to using forethought in the teaching vocabulary. Students will have greater retention and repeatability of musical concepts, singing techniques. Because the students have the ability to sing more efficiently, they will likely have a more positive experience in the ensemble. Singers will be able to make quicker and better progress with their singing voices. Learning efficient and effective ways to sing will increase overall enjoyment because they will learn to sing in more effective ways. Should they choose to pursue music professionally, they may receive more lucrative opportunities and more opportunities early on in their career. There may also be greater retention of personnel for the conductor, which will provide longevity and loyalty for the choir or choral program. This kind of loyalty combined with better musical learning could also help create more lifelong music supporters, which in turn helps fill concert halls and also provides financial assistance to the schools and arts organizations. <clears throat> My data collection was based on two polls, uh, for the record forums and Facebook, and I posed this question exactly as it looks. 10 second survey for a vocology project, please reply below with something you always say to your choir, a classic saying that's specific to the singing process, resonance, respiration, phonation, and articulation. Thanks. I received a wide, wide range <laughs> of answers, some answering the question, and many others providing anecdotes for their particular choir. The answers are what you have before you, shared between uh, each different uh, chair. I noted three general, general tendencies from my responses. Many of the sayings were problematic because they could cause some sort of false anesthesia or misinterpretation. Many were idiosyncratic, which means strange. <laughs> some of the sayings were directives were just plain incorrect. The difference between the first and third tendencies is that the first needs to be modified and adjusted for clarity. The third needs to be replaced with a different directive that is factual. My collection of data was the list of common sayings on my two Facebook polls. Uh, the two Facebook polls were, I'm a choir director, uh, and the other one was the American Choral Directors Association official page. The two uh, groups respectively had 26,000 and 16,000 people, and in total I got 331 responses. Which, compared to this, doesn't seem like a lot, but if you've, any of you have ever done that before, 331 is, is a fair amount. My response to the data, I got a lot of motivational sayings, anecdotes, sarcasm, some kind of inappropriate thing um, <laughs> at times, um, but it was interesting to say the least. Even though I asked for very specific feedback, the range and lack of focus of the responses makes the case for clarity and directives even stronger. 
for the feedback in the survey, I categorized each response into eight categories. Most likely incorrect means that the directive is painful physiological truth and the latest voice science, and the, direct, the directive appropriately captured the meaningful intent of the director or would be beneficial to the growth of the student. Most likely incorrect means that the directive is probably false or confusing. Idiosyncratic means the directive is strange or could be misinterpreted by the student without proper explanation of a metaphor or specific context known to the student. Wrong, but could be changed to become correct and useful, means that the word choice is wrong, but the underlying subtext has an error and could be transformed to become more clear. Frankly wrong means that the directive is likely plain wrong and requires a change in understanding on the part of the teacher to give clear and true information to the student. Leadership is a group of sayings that pertain to the leading a music ensemble. They're not necessarily false directives, but, and they could be great advice, but these responses do not pertain to my original question. Music sayings are responses that dealt with general education, artistry, engagement, and mindfulness. Most were good suggestions, but again, do not pertain to my original question. Finally, I added the category, I have no idea what the directive <laughs> or saying means for those responses that were so odd or strange that I could not prefer what the survey responded was referencing. How to dissect a narrative. The possibility. Mistranslation of directives could affect a student singing negatively. It could also cause a student who is already singing efficiently to change their singing based on conducting the directive and end up with an undesirable outcome. Imagine you have one person in the room who you need to coach and you give a direction to this side of the room and you have all these people changing the way they sing. For example, if the teacher says drop your jaw when the vowel color does not fit the balance of the power squirrel, then you should try naming the desired sound. I am looking for a different vowel shape and tone color. They could also try modeling the desired sound. Also, please give the reason why it is causing the note chord to be out of tune or is not desirable for the style of singing. Give a clear observation of what is being heard. I can see and hear the vocal sound is too bright and too spread in the oral cavity. Solutions. Offer a solution that is specific to a student or group whose singing is problematic for the sound of the ensemble. For example, will you please relax the jaw and be mindful of the shape and position of the oral cavity and tongue as it pertains to the vowel that is written in the school. A vowel modification may be needed depending on the vowel being sung and the range in which it lies. And be aware of what the lips are doing in the process of finding the right tone. Be flexible with the elements of singing and willing to modify them to find the most beautiful and resonant sound of your own voice. Finally, monitor each student, both visually and orally, and repeat the process with feedback until the desired sound is achieved. I've chosen a few directives to talk about today. And from category two, we have drink in the air and lift your palate to not go flat. <laughs> That's the correct response. <laughs> Drink in the air is problematic because some people sip and some people guzzle. And you don't want to invoke the swallowing muscles while you're singing. <laughs> reworded, it can take, reworded, take in only enough air for the phrase, but not to entirely fill the lungs. The driver can say more is better attitude, and in case of air, more is not always better. Likely the respondent was asking the student to breathe deeply or fully, but it could unintentionally recruit the valsalva maneuver. The valsalva maneuver is when the vocal folds seal off the airway trapping air in the lungs. This provides what is known as thoracic fixation, which gives one stability or back pressure for excretion in childbirth and heavy lifting. The original directive might cause the student to take in too much air and recruit the false vocal folds to retain the inhaled air. It can inhibit vocal fold vibration and greatly alter the voice quality. Thus, over-breathing is not conducive to a healthy three-phone voice set. Lift your palate to not go flat. It's problematic because the position of the palate nor the, is not the sole, excuse me. The position of the palate is not the sole, nor even a primary factor to determine one's pitch. Pitch control includes elements of breath, pressure, glottal deduction, airflow rate, vocal fold length, and the thickness of vocal folds at their vibrating margins. The vocal folds must be elongated using the cricothyroid muscles for pitch to ascend and shortening using the thyroid muscles for pitch to descend. The survey respondent is likely asking, trying to get the singer to internalize the virtual nature of the pitch spectrum and be mindful of their pitch accuracy while they sing. 
is kind of directed, can cause false kinesthesia in what our protocol calls false body mapping. Our body maps are our physical self-representations. We literally map our own bodies with our brains and where things are and how we think they exist within our own body. This directive is not untrue, but it is incomplete. When the palate is low, it creates <clears throat> when the palate is low, it creates true <laughs> <and> resonance <laughs> in our body, which amps our harmonics. <laughs> <laughs> Lifting the soft palate flows with the nasal cord, increases higher harmonics, and can aid in the perception of in tune. So we must either give a complete answer, or an answer that it does not state a singular solution for multifaceted and complex singing issues. Category three, sing like manly men. <laughs> sing like manly men is problematic because in the current decade, much has been posited about gender normativity and whether certain behaviors and stereotypes of binary gender roles are still valid and relevant. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it is not a good idea to use this directive because it could alienate some students. It is better to use non-binary language in the choral setting, or any setting for that matter. We use uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, instead of men or women, or ladies or gents, or whatever. Um, this directive was likely intended to get the tenors and basses to sing with a more robust sound and a forte dynamic. This could be accomplished more effectively by instructing them to utilize their air more efficiently by increasing breath control, thereby increasing the closed quotient of the vocal folds. The goal of breath support in singing is to provide a stable supply of air at the correct pressure for the desired pitch and loudness. Category number four, wrong but could be changed to become correct and useful. Blend with your neighbor and check your posture. The directive blend with your neighbor seems like a true directive. However, there is some more communication and nuance that is needed. Asking a student to blend with their neighbor could mean many things. It could mean using one's ear to listen more carefully. It could mean monitoring one's volume. It could mean choosing a different resonance strategy. It could mean changing one's mouth shape. Blending involves uh, many variables uh, that, and requires individual attention on the part of the singer and teacher. James Jordan, in his article on false blend, highlights this point. Vowel descriptions are usually suggested to help blend, intonation, or ensemble sound. Those prescriptions, however, are only as meaningful as the degree of vocal technique that each singer brings to the rehearsal. More importantly, group prescriptions cannot cure individual vocal problems on a long-term basis. A rewording of this directive might include, be mindful of your personal vocal production and how it interacts with the vocal sounds around you. Check your posture. Everyone has different ideas of what comprises good posture. Maybe you remember from elementary school. The teacher said, I think it's like stack your blocks, and everyone just went like this, <laughs> which is not conducive to singing nor noble posture. <laughs> Checking one's posture can cause a student to stand up extremely straight in a way that's unnatural for the body. Barbara Conville suggests replacing the word posture with alignment. Reworded, check your posture to check your alignment. It invokes a completely different thing. I see some of you moving your necks right now. Yeah. <laughs> there are many reasons for stories, sayings, and pedagogical tricks. And we must acknowledge that sometimes it's both correct and effective to use them. However, as made evident by my Facebook poll, there are some confusing directives being used in music classrooms. <clears throat> the use of imagery is a time-honored method teaching, singing, and many useful images are actually at odds with physiologic reality. Some singers will confuse imagery with reality and base their technique on a concept that was useful as an image, but dangerous as a core belief. Many teachers think imagery will solve vocal problems because in a past rehearsal, to their knowledge, imagery worked temporarily. Often the teacher is trying to solve a problem within the choir or section in the least amount of time. Of course, the teacher would never intend to spread misinformation. But of the over 300 responses I received, 14 were correct in their directive. And those are in, I think, the first category. To fully explain what one means in a rehearsal is not a waste of time, but a truly teachable moment. Medical doctors are told to do no harm. 
The same standard of practice should be applied to most professionals. At best, I think it is irresponsible as an educator to use imprecise language, and at worst, to have the potential to do vocal harm. In conclusion, we have examined the importance of using clearly worded directives in formal rehearsal that are in the physiological truth and the latest with science. Clarity is important for retention and repeatability for the student. Clarity also reduces misinformation about vocal production in the choral and vocal community. We have explored that vivid and eloquent sayings, anecdotes, and whimsical stories while entertaining, if not rooted in facts, may cause confusion and have the potential for vocal harm. Through the analysis of collected data, we can further explore examples of common choral rehearsal phrases that can be modified or reworded to become clearer and more correct, and why sweeping generalizations are less effective than identifying a problem at its source. This requires courage and a cultivated relationship between the student and the teacher. This courage comes from creating a positive culture and learning environment in the classroom. Here are some of my sources. <laughs> Here are more of my sources. Thank you very much.
profession you see, do you have any of these anecdotes or phrases that you like to use that you think exemplify uh, the stuff that you talked about? Like, I know you always say, like, sit well. You sit well is, is one of my favorites, yeah. yeah, because it's kind of like check your, or check your alignment, because it doesn't say, would you sit up? Yeah. Because that just does this, or like, oh, fine, sit up. But sit well, because that means something different to everybody, sitting well, because depending on your ability, um, you could still be in a wheelchair and sit well, as opposed to an able-bodied person sitting well. It just changes for everybody. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of choirs, you have, especially in the younger age group, let's say like 13 to 15 year olds, the singers are often swept by a lot to their awareness also to spend a lot of time with the music. Yes. So a lot of the um, by other suggestions, clear suggestions, if you give them often will probably just go over their heads. Yeah. So I feel like that's why people try to take the shortcuts. Mm -hmm. What's your suggestion for like find a bridge between Great them? question. So the answer to that is um, as teachers and pedagogues, it's our responsibility to learn this material and to be able to use it and synthesize it in our rehearsals or in our studios and be able to take what we know and formulate a directive that makes sense to the person or the student or the age group and does it in a way that's clear but also doesn't go over their head or undermine their intelligence. It's, it's really tricky, especially the younger age people who are just learning how to sing, they might not know anything what you're talking about. So it's, it, the tricky part is coming up with something that is true but also works for that particular student. Yes, Emma. Yeah, I guess I wanted, do you find when you research or even in your own teaching, um, do you think it's better uh, to use like a, a directive that's more culture based initially or after you've backed it up with a more scientific description of what's going on? Like, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about that the other day actually, and I think, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's both. It depends on the situation. Uh, one thing I was thinking of just the other day is it's, it's a little bit easier to use a, a, a more whimsical story uh, when you're talking about something that has to do with artistry or musicality as opposed to vocal text. And I think there might be a, a distinction there. Um, it's, not, it's not always that or it's not never that, but I think you could get away with that a little bit easier maybe. Final question. Yes. Uh, that's in your face and there everything is connected here to the um, some of the muscles that are around here the extrinsic muscles that connect to the hyoid point and to the point the bone <laughs> uh, to the, which connect to the larynx and so it could affect uh, the singing voice in that way with, with unnecessary things that are going on but, but I'm say what exactly that means with a clear directive. I just say something like palm, palm trees, not pancakes, whatever it was. And then, and then all of you are like, well, now for the rest of my life, I'm going to say and think that in every professional setting that I'm in, or in, in, in any teaching environment that I'm in. And then when you meet with other musicians, they're like, again, what are you talking about? Or what does that mean? So that's why. It can create a divide within the classroom or the 